So yeah, so I'm Jacob Miller coming here from Zapata AI, um, and I'm going to be talking about a method that we've been developing to kind of jointly train uh, quantum and classical models in uh, using a method that is called synergistic pre-training or just synergy for short. Um, and so just sort of setting the background for all of this, so everything I'm going to be talking about today is in the realm of variational quantum algorithms. Um, and so we've already heard a lot about kind of specific variational quantum algorithms. Um, but just in general, the, the thing that these share in common um, are that they have a quantum circuit. The quantum circuit has parameters in it. And you vary the parameters uh, to achieve some sort of desirable performance in a task of interest. And you do that in particular by optimizing some sort of objective function, where the objective function is supposed to be such that when you have a low value of that, uh, you know, you kind of get nice behavior in your task of interest. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can apply uh, variational quantum algorithms. Um, at Zapata, a lot of what we do is focused more on the realm of machine learning. Um, but I know for people here, uh, you know, applications like VQE in particular, like in Sophia's talk on Monday, um, you know, are of particular interest. Um, and so I don't have much here that's talking about more quantum chemistry, but we have some work in progress uh, that's, that's focused on that. Um, but one of the really nice reasons for uh, you know, working with variational quantum algorithms is we can run them today on modern quantum hardware. Um, so there's, no, you know, there's not necessarily any sort of fault tolerance or error correction that's required for this. You just have a device. Uh, the device has parameters in it, you know, whether they be gate angles or at a very granular level, you know, signal pulses and waveforms. And you just vary those to achieve, you know, again, a low value for your objective function. Um, so for that result, you know, when people are trying to look at kind of realistic, useful applications of, um, you know, present quantum hardware, uh, VQAs are one of the main areas that they're uh, really looking at for that. Um, and of course, in order to have, uh, you know, variational quantum algorithms, um, you typically use a parameterized quantum circuit to do this. And so a parameterized quantum circuit, PQC for short, is just the circuit that has the parameters that you're varying um, to achieve this low loss value. Um, these things are often uh, fixed, but of course, like you can have procedures like adapt VQE, uh, where you kind of grow these adaptively based on things that you're learning. But the, the key thing is just that these have some particular parameters to them. Um, and, and the general algorithm for like your generic VQA uh, is that you take these parameters, you initialize them at some starting value. Uh, these are often done using uh, heuristics, if, if you're sort of lucky, but for a lot of people it's just random initialization. Um, you then use those uh, parameters to uh, generate a circuit that you measure. You, you know, repeat that, uh, collect enough measurement statistics to assess this loss function. Uh, and then once you do that, you, know, you, you basically uh, use some sort of classical optimizer, so some sort of classical control logic that's looking at the previous losses that you got for previous parameter values and trying to make some smart guess about what the next parameter value uh, should be. And so then, of course, you go to that next parameter value. You, know, you uh, use that to you know, prepare more uh, circuits that you measure. And you just kind of keep repeating this until you get some sort of reasonable uh, convergence in your optimization process. Um, and yeah, and, and a question I think that came up in one of the previous talks was just, you know, how do we actually choose what type of onsets or what type of circuit structure we use for this? And I think it's safe to say that it's really, in a lot of ways, more of uh, an art than a science. So there's a lot of different heuristics that go into this um, based on the problem of interest, uh, based on the, the hardware that you're working with, and based on issues of like uh, classical simulability and things like that. But suffice to say that just in each of these cases, we're going to have some circuit that we feel like is a good candidate to use, and we're going to treat the parameters as, as relatively fixed here. Um, OK, so one of the first challenges that come up when you actually try to use VQAs, uh, you, know, you, you run these uh, either on a real quantum device or more often in a simulated setting. Um, and what you find is that you, know, you, you get this first parameter, you measure the loss. It's not particularly great. You then try other values, and you find that the optimization landscape is relatively flat. So this is what's known as uh, barren plateaus. Um, and of course, this is kind of, you know, in cases where you persistently get this appearing, it's a little bit of a dead end to this variational perspective. Because of course, if you keep moving around 
and you just keep getting you know, the same loss values no matter where you go, then you're never going to reach some sort of uh, minimum or even you know, decreasing values of this where you get better real world behavior. Um, or you could think of this as just the optimizer sort of lacking any sort of signal to follow um, that you would have, for example, in like hill climbing algorithms or gradient based optimization. Um, and so barren plateaus, there's a lot of different things that can cause this. Uh, these were originally uh, kind of demonstrated and proven for the cases of randomly initialized parameter quantum circuits. And there's some nice analytical work where you can show that on very mild assumptions about how you randomly initialize uh, PQCs, that you're guaranteed to get um, gradient signals that decay exponentially uh, in, the, um, uh, in the depth of the circuit and in the number of qubits. Um, so th this is not particularly, um, you know, this is not particularly nice, and, and for that reason, I think random PQCs are a little bit frowned upon for that uh, reason. Um, but you can also have, you know, even when you don't randomly initialize uh, your quantum circuits, you can also have barren plateaus that emerge that are connected to uh, noise, or connected to the locality of the loss function that you're trying to optimize, or many, many other things. Um, so it's, it's kind of, you know, it's one of the persistent problems that pop up with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, variational quantum algorithms. Um, and when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this is, you know, like we've seen this before in classical machine learning. This is the same as the problem of vanishing gradients, you know, where you have an objective function, you're taking derivatives, you get the derivatives becoming really small. And in classical machine learning, um, this is more or less a solved problem. There's a lot of nice solutions for this. And the problem is that because quantum computers are really uh, devices that are operating based on the rules of physics, all of the solutions that you would want to use from classical machine learning don't work out of the box. Like, you know, people are like, oh, use a different activation function. You know, instead of this nonlinear function, apply that one. And it's like, well, we're in Hilbert space. These are unitaries. We can't just, you know, apply some weird activation function to the quantum states because that's not how physics works. Um, and so as with a lot of things in quantum computing, you know, we kind of have to find different approaches here in order to solve this problem. Um, but another problem here that was kind of hinted upon in, in um, Abhinav's talk on Monday uh, is that whenever you think that your quantum device is doing something that is, you know, kind of uh, uh, demonstrating some sort of genuine advantage or genuine benefit that can't be delivered by classical devices, you tend to find that the people who build these classical algorithms for optimization and simulation are really good at these things and have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. Um, and so in particular, you know, in order to have VQAs really deliver this promise of uh, demonstrating some sort of significant intrinsic benefit of quantum devices, uh, you really need to have these methods giving better results than any state-of-the-art classical uh, method. Um, and so simulation methods in particular, you know, like those based on tensor networks, are a particular, I guess, kind of risk here or, you know, particularly um, bad for demonstrating some sort of intrinsic advantage. Because, of course, if you can, uh, you know, accurately simulate what some quantum device is doing on a classical computer, then if you claim that this quantum device is giving you some sort of, you know, nice performance and some task, then you could always just take a bunch of classical computers or whatever hardware you need for that, just simulate what the quantum circuit is doing and get the same result without having to use a quantum device at all. Um, so this is something else that comes up a lot, you know, in this kind of quest to demonstrate some sort of uh, nice advantage with uh, quantum devices. Um, and people often talk about this, like, not just in the news, but also like amongst ourselves, you know, in scientific journals and things like that. People treat this as like a race or a zero-sum game or, you know, things like that. And, and I'm guilty of that as well. I've, I've probably, you know, hinted at that, you know, in the way that I've presented this material. But you really look at some of the stories and like the verbs that are used here, you know, sort of imply this mindset where anything that is delivering some sort of, you know, nice simulation result or a better optimization result using classical devices as seen as like an impediment towards quantum devices. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of this adversarial mindset. And in, in Monday's talk by Avinav, like, he put a nice spin on this, that, well, it is an adversarial thing. So it's encouraging us as, um, you know, hardware builders or, you know, people in the simulation world could say us as classical simulation people um, to do better and to overcome, you know, what the, the other side is doing. Um, but I honestly, like, I feel like this adversarial perspective is not really necessary. 
um, and in a lot of ways might be a little bit counterproductive. So let me present a different vision here that we found kind of helpful in uh, some of this work. And so the vision here is something where you can actually use quantum and classical methods in a more cooperative manner. So use them together, where you know, one method getting better can actually boost the performance of the other method. Um, and so the analogy here is like a mountain. So I don't know exactly where this mountain is, probably somewhere <laughs> in Europe. I just got this off of Google. Um, but it's a big mountain, and I don't know how I would climb that. Like I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a physicist slash computer scientist slash whatever, certainly not a chemist on, on the topic of Nick's thing um, from yesterday. But like, I don't know, that's a hard mountain. Um, but you can imagine like, oh, if this mountain, if this is supposed to represent some sort of difficult problem that is, you know, seemingly unattainable or intractable or something like that, maybe I could use a quantum device for this. Because apparently quantum devices are good at climbing mountains and this and that. I don't know. Like, qu quantum <laughs> devices are great, you know? Um, so they're not some of the, the bounds or the difficulties that classical methods might be seen to be impeded by. You know, quantum devices can overcome. And, you know, like um, cursive dimensionality and, you know, things like that. Um, so you could think, okay, well, I'll just, you know, throw this quantum device at this problem and it'll do great because it's good at this stuff. Um, but the problem is when you have issues like barren plateaus, you know, so imagining you kind of pardon the <laughs> poor drawing here, but you're starting at some point here, you know, you just throw this thing in the foothills and it's just immediately impacted by barren plateaus. So it kind of wanders around forever, doesn't really reach anything. And you say, well, you know, that's too bad. Um, so maybe I'll try my classical method on this. And so you try the classical method and sure enough, it's really good. You know, it's, it's like people doing classical algorithms have had decades to work on this stuff. So their methods, they work really well. They just go up that mountain but at a certain point they stall out because of all of these intractability um, issues you know, that, that we're all very familiar with. Um, so what you can imagine is maybe we could use this classical device as like a first step of the optimization. And basically at the point that this classical method is stalled out, we pass the torch to the quantum method, uh, we set it up such that it can kind of continue from the progress that's been set by this classical method and just continue. And what do you know, it climbs the mountain, we can plant our flag there and declare quantum supremacy or whatever, and um, you know this is great. Um, so this is this is just an analogy, just to be clear. So the actual idea here, this method that we call synergistic pre-training, um, is as follows. So the first step is that we run some optimization problem uh, on a classical device, and really key here, we make sure to use tensor network methods for it. Um, so we train a tensor network model, um, and, and we could imagine like this kind of arrow here is indicating that we could use larger and larger classical models for this process. Um, so you can imagine that you, know, you kind of keep throwing more classical resources at this and, and working with models that have larger capacity, and you get better and better performance, again, in terms of this objective function, which is you know, a proxy measure for how well this thing actually does something useful. Um, but of course, there's a limit to it because you know classical methods, uh, you know, ultimately things become intractable for them. Uh, so what you then do is you transfer the parameters. So you use a particular method that I'm going to talk about a lot here to convert this tensor network model into uh, some sort of parameterized quantum circuit. And, and crucially, the, the, the point of correspondence here is that because tensor networks are representing tensors and because quantum states are just examples of complex value tensors, um, we can talk about the, the distance in Hilbert space between the thing that's output by this classical, you know, the thing that's represented by this classical tensor network and the output of this parameterized, you know, this quantum parameterized uh, circuit. Um, so then once we've made this transfer, we've set some sort of parameters here, um, which is indicated by, you know, kind of this circuit down here. Um, we then add some more gates. And, and the reason for this should be obvious. If we have anything that we were able to initialize here through simulation, uh, this circuit alone is too easy. So we add some more gates on here, such that, again, this circuit is basically at initialization representing the same state as this thing. But now the model is more expressive. And from here, we start our quantum optimization. Um, and so the idea is that, you, you know, again, this is kind of representing the same stage up the mountain. And by setting up the quantum model uh, kind of for success or setting it up such that it does better at initialization, um, you know, I'm going to show in the talk that you can actually do 
better in terms of real world applications of VQAs. Um, so that's a, a one slide sketch of that. Uh, the, the rest of the talk is going to be like fleshing this out. Um, so I guess I'll actually, maybe if you have questions, like I'm sure people ask them as they come up, um, but like ask them later because th this is still, you know, just kind of presenting a big <laughs> idea. Um, so, and I, I want to, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, everybody who is a part of the different work that I'm going to talk about here. So there are two papers uh, on this. Uh, one of them is in quantum science and technology. The other one is almost published, um, but we're kind of in the last stages of the, um, uh, of the kind of back and forth with that. So if, if you want to read them, um, Google them or use the QR codes or whatever. Uh, there's also one more paper that is in uh, preparation right now uh, about using these things on real, uh, like actual quantum devices. Uh, and then also, because this is an audience that cares a lot about chemistry and VQEs, um, Caterina uh, Grazia, who is right there, is currently um, doing some work on uh, actually testing out these methods with like real quantum chemistry problems. So all of these things, like before I started working with her, I'd never heard of like active spaces or I don't know, all, all of the things that you chemistry people use. Um, but she's really good with that stuff and trying to uh, see how uh, this method can actually impact problems of, uh, you know, problems of interest to chemistry and not just machine learning problems. Um, okay, so that being said, I'm going to talk about the second part of this whole process, which is the uh, mapping of tensor networks to parameterized quantum circuits. Um, so, Okay, this is, I, like, I love tensor networks, and this is a talk that's at least partly about tensor networks. So I should tell everybody like, exactly what a tensor network is for purposes of this talk. Um, so just in one slide, like, you can think of a tensor network as a compact representation of some higher order tensor. And by higher order tensor, really here I just mean like a many body state vector and really like a multi qubit state vector. Um, and these are compact representations which can be run on classical computers. Um, so the cost of these methods, so every tensor network is associated to a graph, and the cost of this method is um, based largely on the structure of the graph, uh, as well as the so-called bond dimensions um, of the tensor network, which act as a sort of capacity parameter. Um, and so the rough mapping here, like when you see diagrams like this, the idea here is that a node is representing some uh, tensor. And so something like this just encodes like a, a dense state vector representation of uh, quantum state, where there's just a single tensor and each leg is giving like an interface uh, or a mode of the system. Uh, so something like this contains a lot of parameters, but particular tensor network representations, you know, like this or this or this, uh, the nodes themselves, uh, because they don't have many edges attached to them, they're associated typically with a smaller number of parameters. Um, the edges here represent, uh, the edges that are closed represent particular contractions that happen. And you can think of this as like the way that uh, two particular modes of a system will interact with each other. So for this tensor network, uh, it is called a matrix product state or tensor train. And Paul's talk uh, yesterday uh, talked a great deal about these. So I'm not going to give a, a particularly detailed introduction. Something like this can be thought of as like a 1D spin chain where each edge is connected to the edge next to it. So again, like a 1D um, you know, spin lattice or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you could imagine, you know, there's a particular simple, particularly simple mapping here where if you have, you know, this small matrix product state, you can exactly represent it as, uh, you know, something like a quantum circuit here, uh, where just, you know, this, um, you know, node here kind of corresponds to, actually, that's not a great, yeah, yeah, this, this node here corresponds to, you know, this gate plus the zero state here and kind of so forth uh, for the rest of these. Um, so tensor networks were developed uh, you know, largely in relation to quantum systems and later quantum circuits. Um, and so there's this correspondence that we're going to be using a lot between parameterized quantum circuits and tensor networks. One direction of this is super easy. So if you ever see a quantum circuit, like a quantum circuit really is encoding a tensor network. All of the gates that you have really are um, tensor cores of some tensor network, although with particular constraints, uh, you know, that they be unitaries or things like that. Uh, and the idea here is that a single qubit state, uh, you know, like you see in some sort of ancilla or initialized, um, you know, in a quantum circuit, 
this just is mapped to a first order uh, tensor core. Some larger n qubit state is mapped to an nth order tensor core, which is to say a, a you know, tensor that has n edges connected to it. And any sort of unitary acting on n qubits uh, just gets mapped to some sort of tensor that is of two nth order. Um, and then when you, uh, you know, when you have some particular connection between gates, you know, some composition of gates, that really corresponds to um, tensor contraction between the corresponding um, gates in this case. So really this conversion, there's, there's not really anything to it. Like it's just kind of redrawing it with uh, maybe a different choice of graphical notation, like slightly. Um, but the simulation part is where you actually start to contract this together. And contracting this is really just, you know, multiplying all of the gates by uh, all of the states in there. But what's nice about tensor network simulations is you're not forced to do this in kind of a causal, you know, time-ordered process. So if you have minimal, um, you know, minimally entangled systems, you would think like a state vector simulation will still scale exponentially with the number of qubits, but a tensor network simulation can scale more with the amount of entanglement here because you don't have to contract it like left to right. Um, you can contract it, you know, vertically uh, or something like that. Um, and so tensor net, there's a lot of different methods that are applied to make this contraction process uh, efficient on a classical device. Because, of course, just because you can contract this and get the same result as a quantum circuit does not mean that that is going to be efficient on a classical computer. So a lot of the art of tensor network work is finding approximations or clever reorderings of this contraction process that make all of this stuff efficient. Um, and so there's a lot of art to this, but a really good just rough rule of thumb uh, is that when you have a graph, uh, when your tensor network is defined over a graph that doesn't have any cycles in it, so it's like equivalent to a tree of some kind, it becomes a lot more efficient to simulate. And kind of by extension, like when you have gates in a quantum circuit, uh, that don't form any loops in terms of the topology, uh, there are easier methods of simulation available um, that are not present, you know, with more complicated uh, quantum circuits. <coughs> um, okay, so any, any questions about any of this at this point? It's just kind of background. Okay, we're all on the same page. Um, so going the other direction is uh, harder. And the reason for this is even though every parameterized quantum circuit is a tensor network, not all tensor networks are quantum circuits. Uh, like in order to be a quantum circuit, you know, all of the gates here have to be um, like unitaries uh, and, you know, tensor cores are not generally going to be like that. So if we imagine starting with, uh, you know, an MPS as one example, one common method that people have uh, used to get some parameterized quantum circuit that encodes this uh, is through this nice exact procedure that was developed know, almost 20 years ago. Um, so this is a so-called sequential generation procedure because the idea when you realize this in a laboratory, um, you're basically having some sort of ancilla qubit which is flitting around and sequentially interacting with um, different qubit systems. Um, and, and I think in, in one of the papers on this, they actually literally had a diagram of like, a honeybee, you know, pollinating flowers and stuff, and the honeybee was supposed to be like the bond dimensions of the MPS or something like that. Um, so it's, it's a really, like, it's a lovely procedure in a lot of ways. And before I joined Zapata, I actually thought this problem is solved. Like, why would you do anything else here? We already have this exact procedure. It's really elegant. It's connected to uh, canonical, uh, canonicalization procedures that you uh, use in uh, MPS. And I think you can make this work with tree tensor networks as well. So it's very, very powerful. Um, but the problem here is the output you get is going to be multi-qubit gates. Um, so in particular, you know, when you have uh, an MPS that has some bond dimension, chi, um, which is you know, going to be some integer that's typically in the range of tens or hundreds and sometimes up to thousands, um, the gates that you get from this are going to be things that act on uh, order log of chi. Um, and so what that means is as you work with larger and larger matrix product states, or more generally larger tensor networks, um, this method is going to be giving you gates that are like, you know, 10 qubit gates or something like that. And if you look at anybody who has an actual quantum computer and is nice enough to let you use it and tell them you have this nice 10 qubit gate that you want them to apply, you know, they're going to laugh at you. Like that's certainly not in their gate set. 
Uh, and so there are ways that you could look at synthesizing, uh, you know, these large unitaries um, based on some gate set that's on your device. Um, but this adds a lot of overhead, and it doesn't really give you very natural like circuit structures, and I, it's kind of ugly. Um, so something that you could do instead, which is much more practically useful, but also harder to, uh, you know, to actually carry out, is try to decompose this tensor network into a quantum circuit uh, that is composed entirely of two qubit gates. And ideally something where you can kind of control the depth of the circuit. Because there might be reasons that depending on the device that you want to work with, um, you, you, know, you might want to have shallow circuits or deeper circuits or um, things like that. So ideally, you'd like some sort of control over that. Um, and so in, for our purposes, you know, in order for a decomposition method to provide this link here uh, that's mapping tensor network models to parameterized quantum circuits, and something that, that is useful for kind of this you know, mountain climbing analogy and stuff like that, um, we put together a few criteria that any um, TN to PQC decomposition method should satisfy in order to be kind of generally useful for this. Um, so the, for the first one is that this method has to be um, you know, accepting of tensor networks of any particular size. Um, because for example, there's, you, know, you could look at like people in the past and said, oh, well, let's just look at matrix product states that have a bond dimension of two. So in that case, all of the gates that you get here are going to be two qubit gates. And it's a very nice exact correspondence. Um, but the problem is, you know, bond dimension two matrix product states are not actually that expressive. So we need to work with any arbitrary tensor network uh, that somebody hands us, um, you know, provided some limitations maybe on the topology of it or something like that. Um, we also, you know, I mentioned this in the last slide, uh, we want to output some parameterized quantum circuit that only has one and two qubit gates. And if somebody has some quantum computer that works with, you know, that has higher order gates in their gate set, sure, we could work with that. But this is kind of the, the standard way that you know, real quantum devices are put together. Um, we, of course, want the classical runtime of this to be not particularly bad. Because if we can't actually run this in practice, then what's the use? Um, and in particular, we want this to be efficient relative to the bond dimension, the depth of the circuit, and the number of qubits that it's acting on. Um, and then finally, another kind of natural um, condition is that we want this procedure to actually give us a circuit that encodes the original tensor network state, provided that we give this enough uh, resources in terms of qubits, in terms of depth. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I can immediately come up with something like that for MPS, right? Just by decomposing your five qubit gates into single two qubit gates, right? I mean, say your bond dimension is 16, then you have five, and physical is two, you have five qubit uh, Vs on, your, on the other slide. Yeah. And these I can decompose into elementary gate set, and that will be efficient, right? MPI. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually... Yeah, there are standard procedures for that, right? Yeah, we... I mean, it we might not, not be very elegant, but, well, it is very elegant. It's not very practical, maybe. But, uh... Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's elegant in some senses. It, it is one, uh, one downside of this is we want to kind of overall, like, minimize the depth Indeed, of our Indeed, it circuit. doesn't satisfy that. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, that's a, that's a really nice method. So, formal points, it will work. Yeah, and, and I'm going to give some experimental results here, basically just um, kind of giving a, a sneak preview. We tested out a bunch of methods and just took the one that worked best. And so that would actually be an excellent baseline. Um, so I don't know, I'll, I'll make a note of that. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so again, we, you know, we want something that satisfies all of these. Um, any, you know, again, any other methods uh, besides the ones that I talk about here are very much welcome. Um, so, and what we did to try to find methods that kind of satisfy all of these criteria and work well in practice is we took two different building blocks, like two methods that people had put together um, that are kind of useful for this type of process, and we took different combinations of them. So the first of these methods is something that was developed by, um, by Shi Zhiran, and it was uh, developed a few years ago, published in PRA, and to the best of my knowledge, is the first paper that really you know, took this question uh, seriously. And really, like, I, I think, you know, one and two qubit gates is in the title here. So some of these same considerations were in mind uh, with him. And the process is uh, really, really straightforward. Um, so what you do, you have some target MPS. Um, you're trying to represent this. So you want some PQC that outputs that MPS. But we could think of this as a different way. 
Uh, rather than realizing this MPS from the all zero state, you could imagine building a circuit which disentangles that MPS to some unentangled state. Uh, and then you just run that circuit in reverse and you get you know, the, the thing that you're looking for. So in order to build this disentangling circuit, the idea was you, first of all, truncate this MPS to a bond dimension two MPS. You can then get an exact circuit uh, that you know, outputs that MPS from the all zero state. And the hope is that if you run that circuit in reverse, so something that would disentangle this approximate MPS exactly, maybe, hopefully, uh, you actually get the result of applying it to this being something that has smaller bond dimensions as the output. Um, so the, the expression here is technically the matrix product operator, but we're really doing this in terms of the, the one layer, um, you know, one kind of staircase layer uh, quantum circuit that is uh, output by this. Um, and so you just do this over and over and over again. So the blue thing would just be the circuit which takes all zero ancillas and produces the MPS and you kind of turn it around. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so something that's nice about this is this is very efficient. So the, the most expensive uh, part is just this and uh, this truncation procedure. And that's an exact thing. You just do a few matrix decompositions and you're done. Um, and, you know, you do that, you only do that once per layer of the circuit. Um, so it's efficient uh, and also it allows you to, you know, grow this circuit to any uh, desired depth. Um, so that's also a nice thing because we, you know, we want to have free control over this depth. Um, the downside is that this is purely heuristic. You know, this thing happens to disentangle the approximate MPS, but there's no guarantees that it is going to lead to a less entangled, uh, larger version of this. You know, it depends on how this is truncated. Um, and in fact, in the original paper, um, you know, he found that when you actually apply this and you go beyond the kind of minimum depth that you would expect to need for the MPS, which is namely the, the logger, you know, the base two logarithm of the bond dimension, uh, you actually get the output of this getting worse and worse and worse with increasing layers. Um, and on top of that, like we've found that worst case scenario to not happen in our own work, um, but we have found that this method tends to stall out, that you get deeper and deeper circuits, but it ultimately doesn't converge to the state that you want. And so in that sense, it kind of violates uh, this fourth criteria. Um, so another way that you could do this uh, is with the so-called uh, evenbly vidal algorithm. So th this was not, this is an older algorithm. Uh, it was originally uh, developed in the context of optimizing Mira uh, networks. Um, but it's basically another iterative optimization algorithm. The idea is that you have a fixed uh, topology of gates here. Uh, you know, this is a quantum circuit, so all of these are unitaries. And the idea is that if you want to, um, you know, we want to maximize the fidelity um, between the output of this PQC and the original tensor network. And so basically this fidelity, you can treat this as a loss function that we're trying to optimize. Uh, and you can use an alternating minimization or alternating maximization procedure where you treat all of the gates except for one as frozen. And you say, okay, if I take all of these as being uh, constant and I just want to find the optimal value of this gate, how do I do it? Uh, and it's a very, it's actually a very elegant process. What you do is you kind of remove this effectively from the circuit. So you go from computing a scalar to computing a fourth order tensor. So the so-called environment tensor can be gotten by contracting all of the other gates uh, around that. Um, and so you get a, uh, yeah, an environment tensor, this tensor F, I guess F hat, I forget why we put the hat there. Um, but you then take this, it's not generally going to be a unitary matrix, but you find the closest unitary to it, which can be done using the singular value or polar decompositions. Um, you then get this you know, uh, closest unitary, which you can show is provably the optimal choice of unitary um, given all of the other gates being fixed. And you just do that you know, kind of sweeping through all of the gates here. Um, so it, it's kind of, it's a little bit of an expensive procedure, but you can use some sort of caching or reuse of the contractions um, to make this a little bit more efficient like people do in DMRG algorithms. Why is it expensive? Hmm? Why is it expensive? Um, well, it's expensive it's because... Like it's, it's just the overlap between MPS. Uh, well, it's the overlap between an MPS and a quantum circuit that has a bunch of layers. Oh, but, but in this figure it has a shape of MPS light thing, but... Well, yeah, so this, this is an MPS, yeah, yeah. this is an MPS, 
this is like a, a sandwich. Oh. So, oh, oh, if you have like 10 depths, yeah. Yeah, and, oh, yeah. and so what's happening, yeah, as you increase the depth, it's every stage, like I, I like to call it a sandwich, like it's really an MPS, MPS, MPO sandwich. But at each point you need to like fold the MPO back into the MPS, you know, as you sweep one direction, you need to truncate that. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, you, you need to do all of this and you need to do all of this for each sweep. Uh, of optimizations. And in practice, you're going to need, wait, five minutes? And, and uh, questions, right? Oh, okay. I, I got to speed this up. Um, yeah, so it, it's yeah, suffice yeah. to say it's more expensive. Um, so, but the thing that's nice is this is guaranteed to give you um, increasing fidelities. Um, it, it might not be increasing too much. Um, and it's, you know, the, the performance of this depends a lot on the initialization of the circuit that you start out with, kind of like the, the barren plateaus uh, phenomenon again. Um, but you know, in practice, it's, it's, it has, it's complementary to this previous method here. Um, and so what we did is we found different uh, ways of composing these different building blocks together. Um, we kind of gave a shorthand here. So what, what this means is something like this means you get one layer by using this um, analytical decomposition method, which was the first one. You just keep doing that. This was the Shurjuran procedure. Um, you can also do things where you iteratively do something like you decompose, um, you know, you get that initialization and then you apply this optimization to just one layer. Um, or you could do things like this, for example, means uh, taking the, the Shurjuran, the, the first um, circuit there, and then optimizing all of the gates sort of jointly. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you could put these two things together. Again, we developed this shorthand. And when you do this in practice, um, you find that one of these methods actually does uh, quite a bit better than the others. So it, it turns out also a lot of these correspond to things that we um, found in the literature. Um, so these are all previous methods that people had used in the past. Um, but again, we found here that you know, this method, which to the best of my knowledge nobody had uh, proposed, was kind of better, um, you know, especially when you had uh, less classical resources to apply to the optimization. Uh, okay, so th this is the method that we use for everything that follows. Um, so back to the synergy picture again, you know, we, we've been focused just on this part, um, but we really want to, you know, at the end of the day, we want to get better performance with quantum hardware by using better initializations. Um, so, uh, so we actually ran this, so we did a simulated uh, kind of quantum uh, training process, um, you know, simulated VQA, and we used different types of initializations that were based on first training uh, an MPS. It had, I think, bond dimension, yeah, increasing bond dimensions here. Um, and based on different initializations here, uh, you know, you started out your PQC with that and you optimized. And we found that in every case, uh, randomly initialized circuits, the black curve did not do particularly great. Um, turns out actually uh, setting all of the gates as just the identity gate up front tended to do better. Um, but it still was not very great. Uh, and we found this roughly monotonic connection between the size of the MPS that you used for the uh, pre-training and the performance of uh, the, the quantum circuit that you got. Um, so yeah, and so that was kind of a nice find. That was what we were hoping to find from this. But we actually, the more dramatic result that we got was looking at barren plateaus in particular. So barren plateaus, you diagnose these based on the size of the gradients that you have. And we just looked at different optimization methods and the gradients uh, that we got from them. And so, we, so, so... Sorry, do you freeze the classically optimized layers or do you also later optimize all of them? Once you... uh, we optimize all of them. So I, I do actually have some histograms that break apart the classically initialized gradients and the uh, added gradients. Um, the surprise was that the, the classically initialized gradients were also pretty high, which I, we, we can talk about the reasons for that more. Uh, the following, I have one minute to kind of cover all of this, but th this is all of the, the gradients of the larger After circuit. that, it's questioned, so you just have to go to that point. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, okay. Wait, I thought it was until 3.20 and then the questions were... Yeah. Well, we have many breaks. Okay, okay. Well, well yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get through this. The, sorry to incorporate the questions already. So <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. We, we're going to be okay. Um, 
But yeah, so, so random parameters, this is kind of what you typically get. We looked at different uh, circuit sizes from 6 qubits all the way to 20 qubits. Um, these are different uh, ansatzes that were used for the, uh, for the actual PQC. And we find that in every case you get, you know, with increasing uh, depth, you eventually get this thing saturating at gradients that are decreasing in magnitude exponentially with the, uh, with the number of qubits. So this is pretty typical. Uh, the, the real surprise here was that when you do this, um, this sort of pre-training and get your initialization from this, you don't actually have um, gradients that decay you know, in a really meaningful way. So all of these curves kind of collapse. And again, these are all from different uh, size circuits. Um, so this was a really nice find for us. Um, we also looked at this, so this was just up to 20 qubits, um, and we had some feedback of just, you know, these are still kind of small circuits. You want to do these on, uh, you know, you really care about kind of larger devices. So we did an experiment with the uh, bars and stripes data set on a little bit more realistic um, circuit ansatz, so kind of like a square grid ansatz, a little bit like you have in uh, like Google's uh, devices. Um, and we found actually a very similar thing. So mm -hmm. when you initialize with MPS, even just a bond dimension 2 MPS, you have the gradients being relatively flat. Um, and it kind of makes sense. We, we weren't expecting to see a result that was this nice. But it turns out you do get you know, a little bit of a decay um, that starts to happen with a, uh, with a smaller MPS. But when you do this using something a little bit larger, it seems like you know, this is very limited evidence, but it seems like, at least at these scales, um, using a larger classical model gives you a more robust um, mitigation of barren plateaus. Um, and, and by contrast, this is exactly what, you know, you would expect, that you have this exponential decay with, um, uh, with the size of the system. So, um, yeah, so that was a nice, a nice find. Um, we also have found, so this is uh, upcoming work. Uh, it's in uh, manuscripts still in preparation. But we did run this on a real quantum computer. Uh, I had never done anything on an actual quantum device before. I was kind of trained as a theorist. And my first takeaway was that quantum computers are hard. Um, but beyond that, uh, after making the modifications that we needed to really get this working, this involved using what's called a maximum mean discrepancy loss, which is something that you, if you do QML but you can't actually estimate, um, you know, kind of real distance metrics, you use the MMD because it's a nice sample-based proxy. And we found that a similar thing, you know, that using uh, the synergistic initialization, the main effect was that we, we start at a much lower loss value. Um, but additionally, you, you do get, you know, it's, it's less pronounced than in the simulated case, but you do get some sort of actual decrease that happens through this uh, gradient-free optimization method that we used. And by contrast, when you have a, um, a randomly initialized circuit, this is kind of like what I drew in the mountain climbing. Like, it's just, you know, it's not really going anywhere. There's a lot of noise here. And at the end of the day, the final value that you get is not far from where you started. Um, so we think that this is kind of evidence of you know, this stuff really working on uh, actual devices. Okay, last slide. Um, this is not, like, I've presented this as like, wow, it's this magic thing, it works really well. Um, but there's obviously, as with anything, you know, there's a lot of warts uh, and challenges that need to be worked out. Uh, so the first of these is that, you know, of course, depending on your circuit of interest, you might not have enough gates in there to actually be able to recover the target um, tensor network state. Um, and there are some very, very simple heuristics that you could use, like the depth of this should be like the log of the bond dimension or something. Um, but beyond that, it would be nice to have some better heuristics. Because of course, if you can't actually, you know, if you don't have a large enough um, uh, circuit to realize this tensor network that you're trying to pre-train with, you could argue there's not really a point in trying to use that large of a model. So you kind of need to scale the size of your classical models at, the, you know, at some proportional rate to the, the scale that you're increasing your quantum circuits. Um, another issue here uh, is that we found actually when you use, so even in the case where you can get faithful reconstructions of the original tensor network state, there's this overfitting phenomenon that can happen that the, the PQC that you learn, it might be the case that it's really sort of overfit to the type of topology that it started out with. Like if you do a 2D image, um, you know, a, 
uh, tensor network that's expressing like uh, you know some 2D image data set and it's a 1D uh, like an MPS, it basically has to route all of this entanglement in this really convoluted manner. Uh, so it might be the case that this initialization uh, actually causes overfitting in some cases, where you add on these additional gates, but it's so habituated to making use of the gates that were initialized that it doesn't actually, it's, it's not able to learn, um, you know, to get anything that's particularly useful. Um, this is something we saw a little bit of evidence for this, but I'm sure as you go to larger problem sizes, this is something that will be uh, more of an issue. Um, and so, of course, you know, this question of how do we actually choose the relative topology of the tensor network and the PQC based on the quantum computer that you want to work with, but also on the data set or the type of problem, you know, if it's a VQE, like the, the structure of the molecule, things like that. This is an important question that we're still kind of working on. Um, and lastly, this is all numerical. Um, we still don't have a really good theory for why this actually works. Like, this is a dramatic effect that we've seen, um, but we don't have a model. And because of that, you know, addressing these types of questions uh, is a little bit harder because, you know, we don't have something that we can point to to say, ah, in these cases, we'll definitely get, um, you know, really effective barren plateau mitigation. Um, so basically, we're still kind of trying to figure out some sort of theoretical model that could say in certain situations, you're going to have non-vanishing gradients uh, when you use this type of method. But this is very much a work in progress. Um, so any insights or ideas people have for that would be very much welcome. Uh, so with that, again, want to thank everybody else, all the lovely people who worked on this. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>